better nature to do it. He is referring as a fact to some something, some unwritten laws compel her to do it what she is doing. And for Hegel, this immediate reliance on this ethical substance. You know, Antigone is not thinking strategically, like in certain situations you act like this, like that. It's this kind of ethical, substantial immediacy. Here is this beautiful quote. Zeus did not announce those laws, laws which justify her resistance to Creon. Zeus did not announce those laws to me. And justice, living with the gods below, sent no such laws for men. I did not think anything which you proclaimed strong enough to let a mortal override the gods and their unwritten and unchanging laws. They are not just for today or yesterday, but exist forever, and no one knows where they first appeared. So I did not mean to let a fear of any human will led to my punishment, punishment among the gods. So again, her position here is what Hegel calls immediate ethical substance. You rely on your, let's call it very naively, spontaneous ethical instinct. I cannot do it otherwise, that's the substantial justice that is an or, which is an organic part of my being. Hegel is very precise here. He doesn't oppose this to freedom. Now, let's do a little bit of analysis. Hegel is not saying that Antigone is, it, as it were, dominated by some compulsive mechanism. No, no, this is already the modern notion. If you experience something as some kind of a bl blind mechanism which compels you to act in a certain way, it means you already have a minimum of distance to experience it as something externally imposed. Which is why Hegel is totally right to say that this idea of le homme machine, we humans are just victims dominated by some objective mechanism, this is a typical position of modern freedom. Because, you know, you already, in order to experience something as a compulsion, you already must have a minimal position outside. If you are in the compulsion, it's not a compulsion. Uh, and, and now, which is why Antigone is for Hegel also the figure of love. What is love? Love is, on the one hand, the ultimate freedom, we all know. You cannot fall in love on, a, on an order. You can be, although, okay, it's more complex. In politics, everything is possible. We do say, <laughs> you must love your parents, you must love your country, but that's another point. Let's not go in. What I'm saying is that, let's say if you fall in love. That's the paradox of love. On the one hand, it's free. Free in the sense that you shouldn't be, if you are forced by yourself or by an external authority to love somebody, it's no longer love. So love is in this sense free. You feel all your being in authentic, passionate love. But at the same time, it's not free in the sense that you have absolutely no, no choice. You know what I mean? Like, you cannot say, no, I will not point out so that you will not, you must already probably have a long list to report me to some politically correct committee or what, I don't want to act, to, but, okay, let's, I will look up, okay. Uh, so you, will know. Uh, uh, you know, if I say now I want to fall in love, it's a lady there, 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 let's compare. The moment I approach, it's not love. Love is always, the choice of love is always retroactive. In authentic love, you never know when you fall in love, all of a sudden, retroactively, you discover, I am in love. You cannot, the now is never here. And here you have, I'm so sad we don't have time for it, the most subversive, beautiful speculations of the other great German idealist, uh, Schelling, who goes into this, how uh, the highest freedom is always unconscious. Namely, contrary to the common sense, which tells us, Free acts must be conscious. For Schelling, the ultimate freedom is unconscious. In the sense of this fundamental decision, which you, with your conscious ego, like fundamental decision, like the choice of a love partner, for example, which is contingent, totally free. Like, love is by definition contingent. You never know 
in whom love can be totally, you never know in whom you end up falling in love. But the point is that it is necessarily experienced as something not even blindly imposed. It's simply your nature. You cannot do it otherwise. And I like this Schelling's nice totalitarian view. His idea is that even if you have no choice, you are still fully responsible for it. That what you cannot do is to do is to say he even takes these theological examples. He says, okay, slightly anti-Semitic, I'm sorry, the example. He says it was forever decided, determined in the very fate of Judas that he will betray Christ. He didn't have a choice. It was his destiny. But nonetheless, he is fully responsible for it. And then he makes a much more appropriate, not such a stupid, anti-Semitic, concrete example, and it's true. When he says that when you encounter a truly evil person, and I did encounter some of them, it's true, you can see that their evil is part of their nature. They simply are like that. But nonetheless, they are responsible. Okay, Schelling's uh, solution of this enigma, which you find already in Kant, is a wonderful one. It's a, a kind of a transcendental a priori act. It sounds idealist, but it's not. It's very close to what, in psychoanalysis, we would have called the choice of the fundamental fantasy. That uh, in some kind of a temporal, a priori act, we are, as Sartre would have put it, responsible for our project, for what we are. Of course, in our temporal reality, we experience this as our nature. You cannot change it. But fundamentally, at an unconscious level, we are responsible for it. And this is how also Freud says, when, you know, Freud already answers this boring Foucauldian reproach before Foucault's time, of course, that uh, psychoanalysis is comparable to confession. You have to confess your blah, blah. No, Freud says uh, psychoanalysis is much worse. In confession, you are responsible for what you did, for blah, blah, in, uh, for what you know. You should tell everything. In psychoanalysis, you are responsible even for what you don't know and what you didn't do and so on, no? Because, again, it's this, uh, let's call it choice of fundamental fund. But, okay, uh, now let's go further. Here, you can see the difference between what Hegel calls the substantial ethics, this naivety of ethical substance, where you simply act like this because you cannot do it otherwise, and the modern ethics. The modern ethics for Hegel is the paradigm of modern ethics is Immanuel Kant. There, Kant brings to extreme this idea of reflexive character of all ethical norms, in the sense of, for Kant, the laws that you have, moral laws, moral norms, whatever, that you follow, are never simply given to you. You are responsible for them. This is what Kant means by radical freedom and so on. That, uh, uh, how should I put it? Uh, uh, when Kant makes you, what does Kant mean by subjective autonomy, which is exactly the opposite of Antigone? He doesn't want to say, oh, you are free to act autonomously. No. What Kant prohibits is, you know, this typical ethical excuse. Let's say, I have to hurt you, as part of my duty, I have to do something because of my moral duty which will hurt you and you are my friend. And then the usual hypocritical excuse is, uh, I'm sorry, but I know it will hurt you, but I cannot help it. It's not my choice. It's my duty. No, you cannot say this for Kant. For Kant, you are not only responsible to do your duty, you are also responsible to define what your duty is. You should stand behind it. There is, again, this is typical modernity, there is no substantial other which guarantees, as it were, to you that this is your duty. That's modern freedom. It's kind of a more reflexive freedom. It's not only